study we spend a whole hour asking these questions am I really saved am I really born again does the Holy Spirit dwell inside of me am I really a Christian or am I an antichrist and we spend a whole hour discussing these things and also we ident identified the attitudes the characteristics of a true genuine Christian and antichrist but now coming back to, to first John I don't know if you know this but John's style of writing is very different from the previous two letters that we studied now you know that we studied Romans and Thessalonians and Paul the author of these letters the way he builds up his point it's sort of a, a logical sequence he builds his point step by step First comes this, then comes the other, then the next. That's Paul's style of writing. But John's style of writing is very different. Because it's sort of like he's going in circles. First he comes up with a thought. Then he jumps to another thought. But it's always in the same context. Alright? So let's try, let's try to divide this scripture correctly and let's start 
from where we stopped last Sunday in verse 19. Now, first John chapter 2, verse 19. So this is John writing, saying, They went out from us, referring to the Antichrists. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. So this is the first contrast that John mentions, that true Christians stay in fellowship, stay in fellowship with the saints. But false Christians, antichrists, they depart from the fellowship. They cannot stay in fellowship with the saints. So that was John's first contrast. But we heard a lot about antichrists and false Christians and Christians or let's, let's say people whose conversion is fake. We heard enough about that. Now let's see. Let's talk about true genuine Christians. And let's read verse 20. Verse 20 says, But you have been. Who are the you now? Who is John addressing? But you, he is addressing the genuine Christians, the true Christians. But you have been anointed. You have been anointed by who? By the Holy One. And you all have knowledge. So the false, let's get this right, the false Christians and the Antichrists in the times of John used two words very frequently. And they use these words to, to explain the, the religious experience. And these two words that they use frequently are the words anointed and the word knowledge. So these people were going around in churches saying that they have a special anointing, a special touch from God, a special revelation from God, and thinking they are superior Christians, and seeing all other Christians as, as no one, and they belittled them. So this was their attitude. They would go in churches and, oh, God told me this, God told me that about you. I have this special knowledge about you. Does this sound familiar? We still have these kind of people with us in the churches nowadays. And I'm going to give you an example, an example that happened in my own life. So, I think I was only like two years in the world. And there was this conference here in Malta. And this self-proclaimed prophetess came from the United States. Nobody sent her, but she came to Malta. And she made, she, she made a conference. And I was there, listening to her while she's preaching, sort of preaching. And while she's preaching, she stopped. She stopped, and she, she puts her hand in her, on her forehead. And she's like, uh, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, uh -huh. okay. Yes, yes, I'm going to tell him. Yes, okay, okay. I'll talk to you later, Lord. I was like, I was like what is she talking about? Is this a preach? Or is this a circus? What is it? So she stops and she looks at me, right in the eye. She tells me, you're David. You're David. I'm like, no, I'm Lawrence. <laughs> she told me, no, no, you're a David. I told him, no, I'm Lawrence. She told me, but the Lord told me to tell you that I am going to die. I will die for you. I will sacrifice for you. This is what she told me. And then she looked at me. She told me, will you die for me? And my answer was, no way, I don't know you. Who are you to, to sacrifice my own life? Especially after hearing and seeing all this stuff. No way, I'm not going to sacrifice my life for you. But oh, everyone was clapping and shouting, amen, hallelujah. And I was like, how is this possible? How is this possible? People would rather listen to these phonies to his face, then listen to the word of God. All right, it might look nice.
nice and glittery, and they use nice words, I can I can act it out right now. I can say, ah, oh, I sense a shift in the atmosphere. Are these words familiar? There's a shift in the atmosphere. There's going to be an anointing. There's going to be a revival. The fire and this and that. And this this sounds like televangelists. But is it the word of God? Another experience within a different lady. We were again during a conference and this lady was there. And Todd was with me. Most of you know who Todd is. And she let that Todd and told him, God told me something about you. God told me that when you were 18 years old, something happened to you. And Todd was, I think everyone, when, when they're 18, something happens to them. So she calls him out. And she starts putting her hands on his belly and start putting something out of him, sort of. Like sort of pulling his guts out. Then she throws it on the floor and starts jumping on it. And I'm like, what's going on? This is either a circuit or there's a spirit, yes, but it's not the Holy Spirit. The people rolling on the floor and laughing. Um, this is crazy. And remember, I was just two years old in the Lord. But the Lord was protecting me with people like God. He put this passion in my heart to read his word, to study the word. To be able to recognize if these people are true phonies or not. And we have to test the spirits. And this is John's warning today. In verse 26, John writes, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. These people have one goal. They are trying to deceive you. Now let's go back to the words they like to use. Anointing and knowledge. <coughs> now, the word anointing in the Greek is the word charisma. And you find charisma only two places in the New Testament. And this is found here in verse 20. The word anointing in Greek is charisma. And in verse 27, the same word is charisma again. But what does this charisma mean? Charisma mean an ointment. You know, like when you have a sh shoulder pain or back pain, you apply ointment, so you feel better. So, in context, the ointment that true Christians have refers to the Holy Spirit. So, a true Christian is indwelled, is sealed with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will empower us to live holy lives. To say no to ungodliness and yes to the things of God. Now these people also refer to themselves as the knowledgeable ones. And that's where the term Gnostic comes from. Alright? So I think that's clear. John is warning us about these antichrists. Now let's read verse 27. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. Now let's clear this verse up. Because many take this verse out of context. Let's read it again. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. What is John talking about here? Is he saying that you don't need anyone to teach you? Let me ask you a question. How does the Holy Spirit teach us? So, one method that the Holy Spirit uses to teach us is by illumination. He illuminates our mind. So when we are reading scripture, we can understand what God is saying. We cannot understand what God wants us to understand unless we have the help of the Holy Spirit. So that's one way that the Holy Spirit teaches us the Word. He will help us to understand it. But there's another way. 
If we go back in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 14, we read that God gave to the church, he gave them what? He gave them some exhorts on the stage. What did he give them? He gave them the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, what did the Holy Spirit give to the church? He gave apostles, he gave prophets, he gave evangelists, he gave teachers, and <coughs> shepherds. For why? For the building up of the church. Right? So the Holy Spirit illuminates our mind to understand scripture, and he gives us people that they can teach us. So John is not saying, listen, you don't need anyone to teach you. I, I, I met some of these people here in Malta. They said, oh, I don't need anyone to teach me. Hey, who are you? I have the Holy Spirit. Up. I don't need anyone to teach me. I met these kind of people. But that's not what John is saying. John is saying, if these false teachers, if these teachers don't bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, they have no business teaching you. So unless you see the fruit of the Spirit in the life of these teachers, they have no business teaching you. So this is John's morning, and not to go around saying, ah, I don't need you, I don't need anyone. Now to wrap things up, because it's already, it's already time. Let's go to verses 28 and 29. Now again, before I continue, um, today, on Sunday, is just a preview. It's just a foretaste. Because in 15 minutes I can't say much. So I encourage you to please be present during my disciples. Because we can divide the scripture better. We can have more time to understand what God is trying to tell us. So verse 28, this is now, this is more encouraging now, this is more uplifting now. And now little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence, and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. So these verses, they are sort of a transition to chapter 3. In chapter 3, we will learn about what it really means to be born of God. What it means to be children of God. So John here is doing that transition. But before that, he, he, he gives another contrast. If you remember from last week, we mentioned some contrast between Christians and Antichrist. And the last contrast that John mentions is this. Listen to this. When he appears, when Jesus appears, we may have confidence. So, when Jesus shows up, true Christians will have security and confidence. And they will not be embarrassed of Jesus because they lived their life for the glory of Jesus. But Antichrists, what will happen to Antichrists? What will happen to the weeds? If you remember the parable of the weeds, Jesus will burn the weeds. What will happen to Antichrists when they see Jesus face to face? So for Christians, true genuine Christians, when Jesus appears, it will be the first best day of eternity. But for Antichrists, it will be the worst first day of eternity. Can you see the contrast? Am I a true, genuine Christian? Or am I an Antichrist? Ask these questions. And before, before we close, let me ask you another question. Imagine Jesus walking in this room right now. Right now. Would I lift my head up and rejoice to see the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, or will I duck my head down in embarrassment? Because deep down inside I know, I know that truly I haven't surrendered my life to Jesus. What would I do? If Jesus was in right now, would you be 
rejoicing, running towards him. Yes, Jesus. I stayed in the fellowship. I continued in the faith. I kept persevering. The fruit of the Spirit were flowing out of my life. Or would I be ashamed? I would be literally naked in front of Jesus. My deeds right in front of him. So if you're a strong, genuine Christian, I encourage you today. I encourage you this morning, keep running the race of faith, keep strong, stay in fellowship, fellowship with Christ, abide in Christ, stay in fellowship with other saints, read his word. But if you're the other guy, if you know that you're an antichrist, or let's say not an antichrist, but you've been lazy in your in your walk with the Lord. Now is the time. Now is the time to invite Jesus in your life and tell him, yes, you are my Lord. Take over my life. I surrender my life unto you. We are, you are here this morning. We are here this morning. We have breath in our lungs. We're, we're strong. We're here. So God is giving us another opportunity. Let's make things right with Jesus. He is our God. He is our master. At what contrast it will be to live our eternity in the presence of King Jesus. Lord Jesus. He is our God. He is our master. He is our savior. He is everything that we have. What do we have except of Jesus? Nothing. We are nothing but filthy rags. But in Christ Jesus, we are his children. We are his righteousness. Stand up this morning. Let's praise Jesus. Let's thank him for who he is. We thank him for he is God. He is good. His love endures forever. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your promises. I thank you for your warnings. Lord, I pray for each and every person in this room. Lord, I pray that we will grow a hunger to know the truth, your truth, Lord, to be able to discern the true Christians from the fallen ones, Lord. Yes, Lord, help us. Help us so that when we go out of this place, we will look more like you and less like the world. Yes, Lord, if we say that we are Christians, the fruit of the Spirit must flow from our lives. Help us, Lord, to examine ourselves. Help us, Lord, to evaluate our faith so you get all the glory.